What's up, New York Comic Con? I'm Will Wheaton, and I am actually coming to you from Los Angeles, California. I don't know if you're aware of it, but we can't exactly travel right now. So Ernie and I have gotten together over the magic of the internet to talk all about Ready Player One and to talk a little bit about Ready Player Two. So please, wherever you are, especially if you're in a public place, Give a warm round of enthusiastic applause for my friend, my colleague, for the writer of Ready Player One, Ready Player Two, and Armada, Mr. Ernie Klein. Thank you. Thank you. And for what we as well. Ernie Klein, it is a heckin' delight to see you. You look terrific. Your DeLorean looks amazing. I think it's really fair and really accurate to say that Ready Player Two is probably one of the most anticipated sequels uh, uh, absolutely of the last decade, certainly uh, um, of this year. The book comes out November 24th in the US and the UK, and then you are being published, you know this, you're being published in over 50 countries. Talk about what it means to be the author of something that is known around our entire planet. You know, when I dedicate the book to my family members. We like going through the foreign editions to see how our names have been translated into other yeah. languages. It's, it's, it's hard to process. And um, I, uh, uh, you know, especially when you're in quarantine, you know, when I think about uh, all the uh, trips and uh, uh, experiences I got to have as a result of this book, I'm just incredibly yeah. grateful because I've been, I'm sure you're this way too, I've been drawing on them all year, you know, kind of living in my memories and thinking about all the uh, uh, experiences I got to have as a result of this book. I got to go to Finland and Norway and Italy and uh, uh, meet people who enjoyed my book in languages I can't even, you know, speak or read. It was, it's uh, really, really gratifying. And it's, uh, I feel like um, the lesson I learned is if you kind of build a bonfire to the things that you love and celebrate, you know, all the things that yeah. you love, then it uh, ends up drawing uh, other people who love those same things to you. And uh, it has ended up connecting me uh, uh, to people who inspired me to write the story to begin with. So we're recording this for New York Comic Con. Normally we would be sitting on a stage together. We would be having this conversation in front of a room filled with people. Uh, the good news is we get to reach more people this way than we would be able to reach in person. So let's go back to Comic Con when you were standing on stage in Hall H with Steven Spielberg. When I read Ready Player One, when I read Ernie's book, it was like the most amazing flash forward and flash back at the same time to a decade that I was very involved in, the 1980s, but to a flash forward about a future that I think is out there awaiting all of us, whether we like it or not. I have never really had an opportunity to talk with you about what it was like for you to be on the set, what it felt like for you to watch that film adaptation of your work come together. It was the best kind of creative experience, collaborative creative experience I've had uh, in my whole life. The best you could hope for is that it captures the spirit of the source material. I felt like uh, everybody who worked on the film, especially Steven, was invested in um, uh, uh, doing the best adaptation of the book that they could. And I know for yeah. a fact, he, he used to, Zach Penn, the other writer, he would uh, uh, told me that Steven would just send him pictures of pages of the book. He would say, here, just do this. Like there's a, there Amazing. are documents at Warner Brothers that are just pictures of Steven Spielberg taking pictures of different pages of the book. And, wow. and one of them, you know, and there was, you know, there was also moments like uh, Mark Rylance uh, brought the book to, to Steven when they were filming the, the final scene with Anorak and said, I want to say these words that are not in the script, but they're in the book. And Steven mm -hmm. let him say the words directly from the book that weren't even in the script. And now, you know, they're, they're in the movie just because uh, Mark Rylance, you know, connected with those words in the book. So everybody, I just felt so much love and, and everybody had such affection for the book. And I saw copies of the book everywhere in every department. You know, that was the other thing, getting to go onto the set. It's just like a dream, Will. And, uh, uh, yeah. you know, it's, uh, I'm going to treasure that memory forever because what is ever going to top that? What could ever top, you know? And then I got to, uh, when the movie came out, we got to premiere it here in my hometown at South by Southwest. They took over my whole town. Steven and the whole cast and crew came to my town. I got to drive my DeLorean up to the Paramount and we had the world premiere uh, here. So it's just all, uh, it was like a, like a dream, you know? Often, like things will be going so well in your life, you'll wonder, is my life a simulation? Am I being messed uh -huh. with? Because this is clearly 
So that was all of 2018 for me. It came out on my birthday. The movie came out on on my 46th birthday uh, because they cool. moved the release date. So I know, no, it's it's uh, it's unreal. So it's, it's the best birthday present of all time. I'm kind of hoping that this is all a simulation and every day <laughs> I walk outside and I say computer end program, just in case. I know, right? So far yeah. it hasn't worked. Let's Colin talk about your- Calling for the arch. Arch. All the time, <laughs> Why? Who's the idiot who disabled the safety protocols? This is insane. <laughs> uh, let's talk about your DeLorean for, for a minute. Let's, uh, there it is. Uh, your DeLorean um, is legendary. Um, not just like as as uh, as as the amazing car that it is, right? But it is legendary for what you have done with it. You got it into your movie. You put it into your book. Uh, have you done anything cool with it lately? So I got to take the car onto the lot at Universal uh, once I got the uh, plutonium chamber and everything done. So I got to drive onto the lot and go to Courthouse Square with my DeLorean. What? Uh, and uh, please tell yeah, me you went 88 miles amazing. an hour. Yeah, please a, tell me you went. Please tell I, me you threw caution to the wind and went 88 very, miles an hour. I I don't think I could quite get it up to 88 miles per hour. It's a very short street there. Uh, but uh, I did I did drag race a little bit. But there was a uh, there was a New York Film Academy it was having like a summer camp thing there with a bunch of kids. When I pulled out square, all the kids saw this DeLorean and like I think we have video of this them like rushing up to but then I got you know I parked the car right in front of the court uh, of the courthouse and uh, uh, you know uh, across from the cafe even now during quarantine I'll still you know I've been taking the car out and take it for a drive just because it spreads joy you know wherever people see it it, it, oh, that's really it brightens cool. their day a, a, a little bit so um uh, hopefully we'll get to take it back out on the road again someday on another book tour. Um, uh, but uh, right now I just, when I was working on Ready Player Two and I would get like stuck and I needed like creative jolt, I would go come sit in the time machine and like try to drink in all the geek energy and re-channel it into the, into the book. When, when you wrote Ready Player One, virtual reality was science fiction. And uh, just, uh, just a, a, a couple of weeks ago, I did uh, a virtual reality event with some of my friends from the Roddenberry Corporation. Uh, I put on the gear, I grabbed the little handy things, and I went into a, a, a virtual world where we built a stage and a game show set, and then we played a version of the dating game with Star Trek fans. It was really silly and it was really fun. And I heard people saying, this is like the Oasis. I heard that over and over and over again. Have you experienced virtual reality as it exists today? And if so, where does it land in your expectations for virtual reality today based on your creation of Oasis and all of the haptic feedback uh, peripherals? When you mentioned uh, the Matrix and mentioned there was, I was not the person to come up with virtual reality. You know, I was standing on the shoulders of giants like Neil Stevenson and Snow Crash and Absolutely. William Gibson with Neuromancer. Gibson, those books sure. had a huge, oh yeah, those books had yeah. a huge influence on me. What I was just doing, they wrote those books on typewriters, you know, back in the yeah. 80s uh, or, or, or early word processors. I was kind of building on growing up with, watching the evolution of EverQuest and World of Warcraft and seeing virtual worlds actually come about and see people get really invested in them financially and emotionally and yeah. meeting other people and falling in love inside of, you know, uh, virtual worlds, all of that uh, had already kind of started to happen by the time I was uh, working on Ready Player One. I just tried to extrapolate it into the future and I was wrong. I, I, I aimed too far ahead, you know, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy by imagining it, you know, inspired other people to actually uh, uh, make it come about, which is, you know, something Star Trek has been doing since the sixties, you know, like the sliding, yeah. the sliding glass door, you know, at grocery stores were inspired by Star Trek. You, it's easy to imagine something. It's much harder to actually go uh, make it work. So, but I'll tell you last night, I watched Bill and Ted uh, part three in virtual reality with seven of my friends uh, uh, using an app called Big Screen. And, and they were in all like four different time zones. And yeah. uh, we were all kind of in a virtual movie theater together and uh, uh, watching this movie, you could hear, you know, uh, people laughing around you. And it was, the, it was the closest I felt to hanging out with my friends, you know, in 
in half a year. And I've been using virtual reality to keep in touch with my friends. It's not, you know, it's not as great as what we, uh, what I imagined in Ready Player One, but it's, uh, for 2020, it's pretty great. I'm glad we have, you know, uh, the version of virtual reality that we do. And I think it's just going to get better and better. It's getting better all the time. And uh, I'm, I'm really amazed at, uh, uh, at what's happened just in the past 10 years, right? You know, we used to have a, a really crappy uh, kind of arcade virtual reality uh, uh, Dactyl Nightmare. I don't know if you've got to play Dactyl Nightmare, which is like one of those early big, uh, uh, like nine, late nineties. Very, yeah, it's like very, a lot of shaded polygons. It's in the same sort of yeah. emotional spaces like Stun Runner and and some of those, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's how far we've come. I, I think a lot about the way that Bill Gibson and Neil Stevenson really inspired the way we came to expect cyberspace to exist like like when we're the same generation when we were in our early 20s the internet was dial up it was a terminal window it was uh maybe 40 columns by 80 column uh by, by 80 rows um like it was just a little thing and the closest we got to gaming was like a multi-user dungeon or uh, or a starship simulation or something like that those guys clearly deserve credit for helping create cyberspace. Are you willing to accept credit for helping design our expectations for the virtual world? Yeah, I guess I could take credit for that. If you're asking me, I'm, I'm willing to take all the credit that is locked in my direction. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, I, you know, I don't know. I feel like I, I, I did... I do remember talking to Palmer Lucky and um, him talking about Oculus Home and how they were going to uh, design an offline space. So when you logged into virtual reality, you're offline, but you're in your own kind of living room. And that's something that I described in Ready Player One. It's like, we're going to do exactly what you did in Ready Player One. Uh, wow. And I've heard that from a bunch. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's like an instance of like a design idea that I came up with and actually got implemented and now is being used. Yeah. I'll take credit for little things like that. But like I said, it's a lot easier to be like, wouldn't it be cool if... You know, wouldn't it be cool? Right. <laughs> and then, you know, the guys who actually go and build it, I have, you know, uh, nothing but awe and respect for uh, for engineers and, and people with that, you know, uh, it's storytelling is a whole different skill set. So I'm glad to contribute yeah. from my storytelling arena. I am extraordinarily honored to have the privilege of narrating uh, the audiobook. Someone told me that you specifically asked for me to narrate Ready Player One. Is that true? It is true. Uh, they uh, asked me if I had any suggestions, and I, it was a list of one. Uh, and it no was way! I had heard, yeah, well, you had already done uh, Scalzi, several of Scalzi's books, uh, yeah. Ancient of the Stars and a few of his, and, yeah. and I was just blown away. Uh, by those and you always just knock it out of the park because you don't some people just read an audiobook and but you perform it well I've had so many people tell me on book signings that they listen to that audiobook like every night to go to sleep I <laughs> and, that uh, too. It's, like a, it's like a comfort thing for a lot of people it really like uh, uh, makes them feel good so you know and we did a good thing obviously you know when they I still can't believe five months at number one Five months at number one, uh, when yeah. and the first ever number one audiobook, New York Times audiobook in history, and then stayed there just all summer long. It was, you know, uh, it's a tribute to what a great, great job uh, that you that you did, and I'm so grateful to you for joining forces with me then and, and joining forces with me again now. I think uh, it will bring a lot of joy to people. I know that you can't talk a lot about Ready Player Two, but I'm going to narrate it. I am unbelievably excited to, uh, to, to read it and, and to find out just what comes next. You know, these characters that you created are so relatable and, and they, are, they are so three-dimensional and I care greatly about all of them. I understand that your life before Ready Player One was not as glamorous as uh, as, as as your gorgeous DeLorean would would indicate it is right now, and that your life experience actually inspired some of your storytelling. Uh, and and um, I uh, I heard a little bit about this, but I want to hear it from you, and I know fans want to hear it as well. Talk about 
the time before Ready Player One was published, when you were writing it, what your situation was like then, and, uh, and, and what kind of work you did, because it's a really inspiring story. Thank you. Well, uh, it took me a long time to write Ready Player One. Uh, I think I, I actually went and found the original notes uh, and the idea that I wrote it down, and it was August of uh, 2001. I was still working tech support, uh, uh, which is not a job that I enjoyed, but that ended up becoming uh, Wade's profession in the book, and his experience and his frustrations with tech support wove, them, wove their way into the story, you know. Uh, when I was younger, I, uh, uh, my family lived in a trailer park uh, for a time. I know my way around a double wide yeah. <laughs> trailer. Uh, and, uh, and I did not, again, didn't enjoy living in a trailer park. Uh, and, but um, I also got a sense of, uh, you know, like, uh, like what could be worse than a trailer park? Like stack trailers, like a Brazilian kind of favela like stack of tra trailers. And that idea, you know, uh, ended up, it was crazy to go to London and see the engineers actually building them, you know, this yeah. idea that I had had, you know, years before, then it was like a fixture on the London skyline. People would see it, uh, at least in studio, driving to work, a real, like, many uh, stacks of trailers. They expanded them greatly with, uh, you know, CGI in the movie, but, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it was crazy. I used to, uh, and when I would, uh, I would sleep in the laundry room of this trailer, uh, well, right near the washer and dryer. So that's like something from my life that uh, made its way all the way uh, into the movie. Wow. And, it, you know, but it's a lesson, you know, it's a lesson for me, like these, like living in a trailer park or working tech support or, uh, you know, being uh, uh, flat broke uh, <laughs> for a long time. Uh, all of those, you know, uh, uh, experiences ended up working their way into my art and changing my life. You know, Ready Player One, if I hadn't had those experiences, I never went able to write the book. So it's like something that I share with other writers who, you know, feel like they're not doing what they want to be doing, uh, but you have to draw on, you know, draw on whatever's going on in your life because those are the, those are the things that will help you build the stories that could change your life. You know, you have to draw on your own uh, experience and maybe you're, maybe you're having those experiences uh, for a reason. Uh, that's what I keep trying to tell myself this year, Will, that, you know, this is going to, this is a, this year is a birthing pains and it's going to change, it's going to change the country and it's going to uh, also create a bunch of art, uh, a, a bunch of all these artists and uh, creative people in quarantine are going to uh, create a bunch of art that's going to change the world. It's, it's uh, uh, good. It's the, it's what art is, right? It's making uh, something beautiful out of the negative parts of life. So uh, that's what I was trying to do with Ready Player One and, and, and with Ready Player Two. I appreciate you saying that because it, 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 it reminds me not to lose hope. And it reminds me that we can take, like the world is objectively terrible right now. And we can take that objective terribleness and use it to inspire meaningful art. That's a real important reminder that I hope everyone watching this who has any artistic tendency at all uh, will internalize that and, and use it to inspire their own work. Yes, I agree. Uh, Neil, that uh, makes you think of uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, great essay about make, make good art. Just make good yeah. art, you know, uh, um, uh, and that'll uh, carry us through. So uh, right. I appreciate you making, making art with me. The clock tells me that we're running up against it. So um, uh, cool. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to put you on the spot and beg you for something about Ready Player Two, something. I don't care what it is, uh, but I know. But I'm excited for it. I know fans are excited for it, and uh, uh, you, I'm, I'm going to lean on our friendship and, and see, if I can, <laughs> see if I can convince you to to uh, to share something. I got permission. I thought you might do this, so I got permission to uh, send you the the. Uh, Book synopsis, synopsis that's going to be uh, on the inside flap of the of the hardcover. Uh, it's okay. The, it's the first description. Yes. So uh, uh, I will send that to you, and uh, if you have it, then you can be the first person to read it. Ready Player Two flap copy. <laughs> An unexpected quest. <laughs> Two worlds at stake. Are you ready? Days after Oasis founder James Halliday's contest, Wade Watts makes a discovery that changes everything. Hidden within Halliday's vaults, waiting for his heir to find, 
lies a technological advancement that will once again change the world and make the Oasis a thousand times more wondrous and addictive than even Wade dreamed possible. With it comes a new riddle and a new quest, a last Easter egg from Halliday hinting at a mysterious prize and an unexpected, impossibly powerful new and dangerous new rival awaits, one who'll kill millions to get what he wants. Wade's life and the future of the Oasis are again at stake, but this time the fate of humanity also hangs in the balance. Lovingly nostalgic and wildly original, as only Ernest Cline could conceive it, Ready Player Two takes us on another imaginative, fun, action-packed adventure through his beloved virtual universe and jolts us thrillingly into the future once again. Holy shit, dude, that's amazing. I'm not gonna <laughs> lean on you for anything else. It's amazing to see you. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just so happy for you. I, I was aware of your work before you were famous and uh, I knew that you were special. I knew that you were a special writer and I knew you had really special stories to tell. And I am really oh, thrilled and, and grateful for the opportunity to be part of telling your stories. Um, uh, I really appreciate the privilege. And I pledge to you and to fans, I will do my very, very best to faithfully bring your work to life with Ready Player Two, just like we did with Ready Player One. Thank you so much, Will. It's, you know, it's a privilege for me to get to work with you and to have you uh, help me, uh, uh, you know, do books, uh, do events like this to promote the book. Your words, like Scalzi's, are very easy to read. There's, like, I feel like, like, because we're from the same generation and because we're nerds with the same cultural influences, that we, we tend to communicate in the same idioms and, and with the same presumed base of knowledge. And, and that, uh, that makes your work just, it makes it really easy for me to bring it to life. I presume there will be a book tour, but it's going to be virtual. So um, is there a place we fans can go to find out where and when virtual events will be occurring? Yes. Uh, the publisher has set up a Twitter account uh, for Ready Player Two. Uh, so if okay. you go to, uh, yeah, if you go check that out, uh, they're going to post all the virtual events there. We have something exciting uh, planned with Roblox. So uh, okay. uh, 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 yeah, keep an eye out for that. I want to remind everyone that Ready Player Two uh, drops on November 24th in the United States and the United Kingdom, and then it will very shortly thereafter be published in 50 different countries around the world. It will be available in the format of your choice, including audiobook narrated by me. And yes. uh, Ernie, thank you for your time. Congratulations on all of your success. Stay safe, stay healthy. And I cannot wait to, uh, to, to call you and just fanboy all over you about Ready Player Two.